Welcome everybody for joining us for this very special event, international event hosted by the A22 Network, which we'll hear more about in just a minute. Uh, my name is Tidal, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from a campaign, civil resistance campaign called Save Old Growth in Canada. And I'm really excited to be here with you today um, to hear about people all over the world doing civil resistance, um, speaking to why that's important, and, um, and also to hear from Zach Exley in particular on mobilization and what that means and what that can look like for you personally and, and how to get involved in um, essentially dealing with the climate crisis in a most effective and um, strategic manner. So this is the first call hosted internationally by the A22 network. Uh, the A22 network is a network of 10 different civil resistance campaigns uh, across the world, and we hope that this event spurs all of you to individually both contemplate your role in the climate crisis, um, to organize, and also to think about respective solutions for your particular location or region uh, where you're calling in from today. So once again, we are recording this call, uh, but it will be only the speakers who are seen. So the recording will be available on the Just Stop Oil YouTube channel in a couple of days. So we look forward to seeing that. And this is what we hope to be the first of many calls hosted internationally by the A22 network. And once again, the A22 network is an international network of high risk civil resistance campaigns across the world. Each campaign has a location specific demand to mitigate climate change through robust legislation relevant to their respective country, state, region, et cetera. So for a more in-depth view of the E22 network, I'm gonna hand it over to Zach from Just Stop Oil to read that declaration. And I'll pass it over to Zach from Just Stop Oil now. Thank you, Tidal. Um, and thank you everyone for being here, of course. Um, so, yeah, we are the last generation of the old world. We're here today to say that we will create a new world where humanity embraces itself, forgives itself, loves itself and commits to continue our great adventure. As the last generation, we will do whatever it takes to protect our generation and all future generations, as is our inalienable right. The old world is dying. We are in the last hour the darkest hour. This world is being decimated before our eyes. We are in between moments. What we do now decides the fate of both this world and the next. So we decide. We decide we are no longer indulging in our fears, our despair, our resentments. We're putting ourselves behind us. Together in community, we are taking hold of a higher purpose the source of what it is to be truly human. It calls to us across the ages, and with its power, we will bring down those who kill to maintain their regimes of extraction. This is the old world. It cannot continue. We are here to make clear humanity is better than to give in to extinction. We are here to say society is not turned away from love and truth. It has not been embraced it has not embraced evil and death. The world we desire, the one we can have, is already in reach, but we have to reach for it. But we are not here to highlight, plead or entertain. We are here to reach for the change that is required for this to happen. We are here to force the governments to slash carbon emissions, nothing less. We are here for action, not words. We have a plan. We are mobilizing in our many nations and cultures. Teams will run projects, projects will make demands of governments. We are reaching out to anyone who will reach back and join hands to create this new world. If we are refused, we will disrupt week after week as those who came before us did many times in the struggle for human rights. We speak directly to the public and recruit in hundreds of open meetings. We commit to mass civil disobedience. This is our solemn responsibility. Sacred rights are sacred duty to defend them. And until everyone is free, none of us are free. Only then will justice be done. 
we will not fall into the trap of hating the other. The other is part of all of us. Our hands do not hold weapons and our hearts are open. We are humanity believing in humanity. We are democracy. We are open and nonviolent. We are care and we are freedom. We will accept the consequences of our actions and look our destiny directly in the eye. While there remains breath in our bodies, we will not stop. This is our life right now. We are the last generation, but we are also the first. We are everywhere and we are coming. Every, everything will change. The old becomes the new and everyone can change. Thank you, Zach. Uh, it really underlines what a pivotal time in human history uh, that we are in the midst of. And um, I encourage you to join the A22 network or to mobilize in your respective location in a nonviolent and organized fashion. And um, in order to create a better world, we all have to move forward together. So before we go on to our guests today, um, I wanna go over that this call can be up to two hours at most. So we're gonna hear from Zach Exley for about 30 minutes, and then there'll be a question and answer period for about 20 minutes. If you do have a question for uh, Zach or, or someone else, please submit it to Ian, uh, who has a star and asterisk before his name. So please submit once again, your questions to Ian, the star before his name, and we'll try and get through to as many questions as possible. After we hear from Zach Exley, we'll hear from uh, Just Stop Oil individuals and also others from Save Old Growth. And these are people who are taking action right now in their respective countries. Uh, these people will talk about what we can do to face this climate catastrophe catastrophic situation and give first-hand accounts of what it's like to step up and, and be in civil resistance and what might that look like. We'll then go into smaller groups and talk about what we've heard, process some feelings, share some thoughts with other people. And I really encourage you to stay for this part. Even if you're not certain if you want to take action yourself, um, it's really important that you listen to these difficult truths and have the chance to talk about them, realize that you're not alone in how you're feeling and process together. And of course, yes, we do hope that you decide to organize in one of your local spaces or to mobilize. So before we move on to Zach Exley, one more thing is we had program speakers, a different Zach and Sarah, um, they have actually been called last, away, uh, last minute to um, a snap election in Pennsylvania and they do send their apologies. So we've, uh, we've had the pleasure to have Zach Exley uh, join us, and he's worked as an organizer for 30 years, starting in the U.S. labor movement, and more recently helping to lead Bernie Sanders' first presidential campaign, and then later founding um, Justice Democrats, a movement that is throwing out corrupt entrenched members of Congress to replace them with young leaders such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman, and many others. Right now, Zach is working on economic and environmental policy with the think tank called New Consensus, where he helped create and introduce the New Green Deal, or sorry, the Green New Deal with the US, um, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So I'll turn it over to Zach Exley, and we'll have, again, about a half an hour talk from him, then we'll have a 20 minute uh, Q&A period. Zach, please take away. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks uh, for having me. It's really exciting to be talking to such a big and amazing group um, that's um, uh, that's belonging to and about to join, I think, is what's is what is who's all here, uh, the the A22 network. Um, this is really a historic campaign and um, that you all are getting involved in. And uh, I think it really has the potential to um, uh, to make good on on the declaration that that Zach, the other Zach, uh, made at the beginning of this call, which was really moving and and beautiful. So, so I'm really grateful to be here, and um, and so I and also uh, it's uh, it's too bad that uh, Becky and Becky Bond and Zach Mallets couldn't be here, but I want to assure you I am fully interchangeable with them because uh, I first of all my name is Zach, and uh, and also. 
Uh, we all, Zach and Becky and I uh, worked together on the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 and have worked together in a lot of movements since then. Uh, and Becky Bond and I wrote a book together. Um, and actually I'll start sharing my screen if that's okay. Um, I've got some slides that I think is gonna help me make some of the points and tell some of the stories that I wanna tell uh, more quickly and, and more interestingly for you all. So Be Becky and I wrote this book after the Bernie Sanders campaign. And I was invited to this call to talk about some of the, um, some of the interesting magic that happened on that campaign and some of the lessons that we feel like we learned on that campaign. Um, I think that the lessons that I'm going to try to share with you very quickly are, are relevant for the kind of campaigns that you're going to be uh, running and that you're involved in now. Um, but of course, um, I'm, I'm not sharing with you any kind of formula or any kind of how to. I'm really telling, I want to tell you about how things played out for us on this particular campaign, how we responded to them and uh, some how we struggled with events as they played out. And, and hopefully that will, you know, just give you some fertilizer for your brains and for your strategies and for your campaigns. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. So I'm going to try to keep this short so that we have plenty of time for that. Um, and we and yeah, and we tell the full story in this book. So please check it out if you're interested. Uh, so the, the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 was an insurgent campaign that came kind of out of nowhere. Um, I know we're in a big international uh, uh, call here, a lot of people from all over the world. In the United States, you might be surprised to know that almost nobody knew who Bernie Sanders was um, on this date, July 2nd, 2015. This was uh, a little bit after Bernie had announced his presidential campaign just a, a couple of weeks after. And, uh, and, and suddenly everybody heard this, uh, this story in the news that 10,000 people had gathered for Bernie Sanders very early on in the campaign. This was, everybody knew that Hillary Clinton was going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party and she was probably gonna be the only one that was running. Um, and so, and, and at this moment in the campaign, Hillary Clinton, all the political reporters knew that she couldn't even get a hundred people to come out to an event and Bernie Sanders got 10,000. So this one event, gave the media an excuse to turn the campaign, the, the Democratic uh, presidential nomination campaign, to turn it from a very boring story of, you know, Hillary Clinton is going to get nominated and there, nobody's really challenging her. That was going to be the story. And the media did not want that story. The media wanted to be able to sell tickets to a big fight. And so Bernie was, was giving the media the fight. Um, and it was through the mechanism of this event and, and um, the, the campaigns that, that you all are involved in, you've already had some of these moments where everybody in your country has heard about, and I know this is really big in the UK, um, you know, people have heard about these groups of, of uh, civil disobedience um, uh, activists actually shutting down really important infrastructure and kind of shaking the nation, right? And so... People have heard the story. That's what, that's what happened here. America heard that this guy from Vermont was running and they got to see him for a minute or two on TV and they really liked what they saw. And that kicked off a, a whole lot of activity. Um, you know, I just did a Google search for that event and, you know, all the headlines were Bernie Sanders draws nearly 10,000 supporters. Um, here's a funny trick, though. I want to tell you something that there were not 10,000 people in that in that stadium. <laughs> there, there, I think there was maybe 3,000 people in that stadium. There were a lot of empty seats, but they spread everybody out and it looked really big. And the, this is an important thing to think about, right? Is that the media often, often the media, they don't want to cover you. They don't want to talk about you because you don't fit into a narrative that they feel like will be profitable for them, you know, that will get people to come and watch. But if you can give them something that fits into a narrative that they think will make them money, then they're gonna cover the hell out of it. And that's what happened here. So they were very happy to say, um, you know, if it plays into a narrative that they're excited about, they'll, they'll take your exaggerated numbers, you know? And I've seen this over and over and over throughout my career. I'm not saying go lie or anything, but I'm just saying that, you know, when you, when you look out at that crowd, be inspired by the energy and take a guess. And somebody guessed 10,000 and CNN and all the other media printed it. 
So, um, so that led to this big explosion of excitement with lots of people saying, wait, what, who's this Bernie Sanders? There's an alternative to the Democratic Party establishment. That sounds amazing. So uh, they, they were like, where do I go? And I really hope that your movement has a very clear uh, website where everybody knows to go and sign up, whether that's internationally, nationally, it should be all of those things. And, and, and the reason is, is because people came and signed up on our site. And this is an important detail. When people came to Bernie Sanders' site, you know, when they put in berniesanders.com or Googled for Bernie Sanders with the first link being his, they wound, when they came to our site, you can see these are the different versions of it, but they all have something in common that this very simple form popped up, email address, zip code in the US zip code, right? And, and so we got their email addresses. Notice we were not even asking for their names because we didn't want anything to slow them down or make them hesitate. Um, you know, we didn't want them to have a second thought after they typed in their first or their last name. We wanted to get their email address. And this is a graph of all of the people whose email addresses we had. Um, and uh, it, it's a, this is, it's like a density graph, you know, so it shows in all these counties and you can see it kind of maps to where all the progressives live, but at the same time, it's just all over the place in the US. And, you know, before too long, we had a million people on our email list and it grew a lot from there, but we had a lot of people to communicate with. And so the question was, what were we going to have them do to help us win, to help Bernie Sanders win the election? And in, I'm not gonna go into details on this, but in the US, we have a very strange way of picking our nominee for president for each party. And that is to go through this gauntlet of little elections in these four states. And so we came up with an idea because usually, there's all kinds of activity in those four states, but nobody does anything in the other 50, 46 states. I had to do some math there. And, uh, and so we wanted, to, we wanted to use these new tools that are available to us on like, the internet and our mobile phones and everything to, to mobilize people in, an, in some way that they could be effective in helping us to win these campaigns. And our main idea was that we were going to get people to phone bank we were, and Bernie Sanders said, we want you to get on the phone and start making calls. And, and we were gonna call, we were gonna mobilize people to get together into little groups like this, which did eventually happen, which I'm gonna tell you the story. And they were gonna make calls to the voters in these first four states. And what they were gonna, and, and we had staff in those first four states. So, um, so we, we, we wanted to call those people in the, that supported Bernie, find out who supported Bernie. And our mission was to basically call every single voter in those states. And in the US, we have these public voter lists, which really changes the equation. We're gonna call all the voters and tell them to go down to their local Bernie office and uh, sign up to actually go knocking on doors and do other kinds of work in person on the ground that we know actually wins the, the, the campaigns. So we wanted to at, let everybody in this huge nation of ours um, call into these tiny little states and really mobilize people in a way that had never happened before in a presidential election. So that was our mission. Um, and you know, we, we, um, we asked people to, uh, we told people we wanted to do this and the Bernie base of volunteers were, are so fun. They started creating all kinds of memes and, you know, getting everybody excited, you know, like we can do this. And so then we sent out our, we sent out an email and sorry, I haven't given this in so long. Yeah. Oh, here's another meme. So I'm a little out of practice with the order of the slides here. Sorry. But, uh, but, you know, they, they came with all these great memes and they were really pushing the, pushing the volunteers themselves were pushing other volunteers to do this and get excited about it. So then we sent out an email to our enti entire email list, which was probably about a million people at that point. And when I do this talk in person, I always say, I always make the crowd guess, how many people do you think responded and signed up to and, and followed through and actually did one call, you know, actually made a call to a Nevada voter or an Iowa voter um, in response to the email that we sent them. And usually I get guesses ranging from, you know, um, 50,000 people followed through or 100,000 people or 500,000 people out of that mil out of the million people on that email list. But the answer is zero. And which you can barely see because of my weird theme, I guess that I have Chrome in, but that's a zero. <laughs> and uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit. It might have been, you know, four or five people followed through, but almost nobody out of that email list of a million people. 
And why is that? Why did people not, they were so excited, you know, they were clamoring. I mean, I, I recognize some faces actually on this call, <laughs> you, you know, of, of Bernie volunteers who were clamoring and, you know, getting angry when we weren't giving them something to do. And now finally we had something for people to do and almost nobody did it. So this is very relevant to your movement because the reason why people don't want to phone bank, they don't want to call, the reason why they don't want to call voters is because phone banking is boring and scary. It's boring. You have to sit there and make these calls and most people don't even pick up and the people that pick up, it's not really an interesting conversation to be like, are you a Bernie supporter? No, yes, okay, I'm gonna add you to the list. Um, and, and it's scary because you have to do something you've never done before. You, you, know, you have to call people during their dinner time and get yelled at you know, and basically become a telemarketer for, the, you know, for a few hours and it's scary. And, um, and so in your movement, I think civil disobedience is not boring, but it's way scarier than phone banking. And so, uh, and so you have you know, an equally hard uphill climb to get people to take action, right? So what did we do? Well, we really didn't, we realized that our email address was not uh, strong, our, 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 you know, connecting with people via email was not powerful enough to get people to do something that was boring and scary, but it was powerful enough to get people to come down and meet somebody from the Bernie campaign. So a few of us on our tiny little team started going around the country and inviting people to come down to meet us. And so we would fill these little halls and with very little preparation because we hardly had any staff um, in our department, we, uh, we still managed to, you know, just one or two emails would get people to come down. And, and so we could get people to take this one action. And so then the question was, what are we gonna, how are we gonna get people from these chairs in this auditorium, you know, or this one, or, or let me find, or this one, or this one, how are we gonna get people from these chairs actually to phone banking? So we really didn't know in the beginning. And so that's where like what was happening here was we, we just asked people to break into groups and we said, we've got this amazing phone banking technology ready to go. We want you to get into groups by neighborhood or by interest and come up with a plan for how you're gonna get people in your community to phone bank. And if, we, if I was with you all in person, and I would, you know, here's another group like brainstorming with a flip board, with a flip chart paper, you know, uh, trying to come up with a plan. And they're, you can see they're exchanging their contact information. I guess I should black that out. <laughs> and uh, and so so if you know how if I was with you in person, I would ask you how do you think that went. Um, but the answer was it went nowhere. Um, like these groups that got together in these first meetings, they went home and they just never followed up with each other. Um, they didn't fall, they just didn't automatically fall into place in a way that led to action. No leaders like got appointed. We just, we weren't giving them enough structure. Um, there was a whole bunch of things not there. So what we did is we, we kept going to meeting after meeting after meeting. You see, I, I love this Bernie Sanders meeting, you know, like people, people came out to see us and, um, and we kept experimenting. And so there was like this two month period on the campaign when our little team went all over the place and we iterated through like a million different ways of trying to get people to take action, get people to actually get into phone banking groups and make calls. It kept not working, but we kept trying. And one really important thing was that every day we would get on the phone, our little team would get on the phone and we would talk about the experiences that we had had the previous day at the previous meeting things that worked, things that didn't work, we would brainstorm. And it was kind of real agony, but it was like kind of glorious, fun agony, you know, trying, trying these things that didn't work and really stretching our brains and our imaginations to try and come up with something that would work. And we did so many wacky things. There was one point when I was, when I thought that holding up a sign would, with, with people's like zip codes was a way to get people organized in the right way quickly. And so I was like traveling with this big suitcase of like foam board signs with like, with like uh, wooden posts, you know, so that people could hold the sign up over people's heads. That's the kind of wacky thing we would do. And, you know, I was literally going to the airport with like these pointy wooden stakes, you know, <laughs> with a big suitcase full of them. And um, so it was, uh, but, but I'm going to skip over all the little details and, and uh, that, of things that we tried. And I'm going to tell you what actually worked um, in the interest of time. So, 
So what we would do is we would ask the people on the crowd, first we would pitch them, well, we, the first thing that we did uh, is we, we said, why are you here? And, um, and we, we want to hear from a few people about what brought you here. And we would look, and I would, and this was an important thing. I'm just going to throw this out there. We would look at the eyes of the people in the crowd and there'd be all these people usually guys you know usually white guys like me they'd be like oh i want to talk i want to tell you i want to tell you why i'm here you know and the problem is is that if you picked on that guy any one of those guys it wasn't always a guy but if you picked on somebody who was like that they were gonna like go on this long speech for 20 minutes about like their one pet issue you know which usually was a, like the most obscure issue that nobody had ever heard of if you picked on somebody who was like deliberately averting your eyes and trying not to speak, then that person would tell you a beautiful story about the actual things in their life, like their kids not being on health, you know, having to go leave their healthcare plan and not be able to afford healthcare and them not being able to afford healthcare for their kids, you know, um, or their kids not being able to afford uh, tuition or, you know, a healthcare story from their own life of when they were sick and like what were not able to afford treatment or a million other things. Um, and so, and, and the people that were really trying not to talk, um, that were trying to not get called on, they were always beautiful speakers and they would always speak for exactly one minute and, you know, and tell their story and then sit down and let us get on with the meeting. So we'd call on three of those people they would tell their stories. Everybody would be in this mindset of how, because of those stories, everybody would be in a mindset of how important it was that we succeed. And then we would tell them about this amazing phone banking program and how it worked and uh, what it was gonna be like and what a difference it was gonna make. And we painted a picture, and I think this is really important for your movement, and I think you do this a lot, The, lead, the, the those of you who are leaders uh, already, um, is we tried to paint a picture of how amazing and powerful this thing that we were building was going to be when we were done building it. When, when, in other words, when you sitting in the crowd there, when you join and become a part of this movement and help build it, and when we go to all the other 300 cities that we're going to in the next few months, um, we're gonna have this, this phone banking machine that's so huge that it will be able to just call every voter in America and we'll be able to outgun you know, all of Hillary Clinton's hundreds of millions of dollars of attack ads, because we're going to have personal conversations with people. And we, we, so we painted this like beautiful picture of what it was going to be like in the future. And it, it wasn't insincere. We were really aiming for that and planning for it. And, and if you join you sitting there, we're going to have it, it's going to work. So, uh, so after all of that, then we would say, okay, so who wants to lead a phone banking party at their house? Who would be willing to do that? Raise your hand. And a bunch of hands would go up, usually about 10 to 15% of the room, but sometimes 20. And uh, so great, and give these people a round of applause. And we say, stand up. And, uh, and everybody with your hand up, stand up. And so then they would stand up. And that's when we would give them a round of applause. All right, yeah. These people are going to lead phone banking parties in their homes. And then we would say to everybody, come on, those people with their hands up, we'd say, come on down to the front. <laughs> and you can imagine they weren't really prepared for that. And, uh, but see, you see, there they are standing up in the front of the room. Sorry that all these pictures are blurry. You know, our, this was like, what, a long time ago, our phones weren't so amazing back then. <laughs> this is like practically ancient history. Um, but then, so we would call people up and like stand them up on the stage if there was a stage. And then we would say, now, we're going to get, these people are going to host phone banking parties, and we're now going to get you all into groups following these amazing leaders here on the stage. Now, look at the looks on their faces. <laughs> they, you know, there's something, this is a really important element of organizing, is that, now, this is really different in your particular kind of movement, because you're asking people to go take really big risks. We were not asking people to take big risks. Um, we were asking people to invite some people over to their houses to do something fun. But back when I was a union organizer, um, I was asking people to do take big risks uh, that would result in them losing their jobs, for example, you know, that could result in them losing their jobs. 
And so it's not something to do lightly. You know, people have to understand what it is you're asking them to do. But I think that a lot of us, we want to take action. We want to do something big. We want to have a really big impact. And if somebody just casually asks us, you know, and then drops it and goes away, we're, we don't get the opportunity to take that action that we might have, that, might, that we might have taken and that might have changed our lives and saved the world, right? And changed our lives in a really positive way. So I think it, this might be a little controversial, but I, you know, my first union organizing boss, he had a way of saying this. He said, he's, and I, I, I really don't agree with this on a certain level, but there's a certain aspect to it that if you're doing this in an ethical way where you're really informing people and really treating people as peers, right? And inviting them to do something that you're also willing to do, um, that this is the way it has to go. But he would say, our method is we push people out on a limb and then we start sawing. And so, and so there, at that point, there's nowhere to go but up. They have to climb and, you know, cause otherwise they're gonna fall. And, and so I don't know if that makes sense. It really kind of hit me at the time. It's a little bit what we were doing with these people on the stage, right? And, uh, but we were, we were making, we were inviting them into something beautiful. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm uh, so very quickly, I wanna go through the, the elements that made this work. Um, little tiny technical details make a huge difference. Look at the boards that they're holding. They're holding a piece of foam board, you know, uh, with a piece of paper, a sign-up sheet. We gave them these, right? And the sign-up sheet is held onto the foam board with rubber bands. Why am I talking to you about these little tiny details? Because they're because these are the kinds of details that make the difference between an action working and not working, right? Between something that has to come together in a big, beautiful, coordinated way and not coming together. And, and it's because we... Um, I, we could not carry a suitcase full of clipboards. You know, clipboards don't stack into a suitcase, <laughs> but we could carry a hundred of those foam boards in a suitcase. And I, I know it sounds like a stupid detail, but but we were going from, from city to city to city. We were doing like three events a day. We didn't have time in each new city to go to, uh, you know, Office Depot and, and get supplies. And we didn't want to waste supplies also, of course. So, um, but th this was an example of the sign-up sheet that was on that's on the board that I was just showing you. So what we were going to do is we were going to get other people to come up to um, we were and I'm going to tell you how we did this, but we were going to arrange the room in groups and 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 we were going to have people fill out these sign up forms that each leader was holding. And if you look at this sign up form, it's it's kind of very uh, complicated. There's a lot of information here. There's specific time slots that people are circling. There's um, asking people what they're willing to do. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on here, but we iterated through 50 different versions of these sign-up sheets at least until we came up with the, with the version that really um, allowed this whole process to work seamlessly. You know, um, here's, a, here's an earlier version where we actually put like um, a calendar on there. Uh, and again, apologies for my slides being a little, for me being a little unfamiliar though I'm showing you, it's been a little while. But, um, and, and you see the, the reason, oh yeah, that's right. Because this was an earlier version and it didn't work out as well as this version because on this version, they're able to, because what we found is that people weren't only willing to just do one event. They were like, I'll do an event every week or two a week. And so you see how this person drew a line through all those dates there. Uh, they're telling us that they're willing to do it every day. And the calendar actually allowed people to say, I'm willing to do it every Tuesday, except this one Tuesday. That little detail solved so many problems because before we had the calendar, people had to say, yeah, I'm willing to do it every Tuesday, but there's this one Tuesday I can't. So how can you get that into your system? Um, now, the thing is we had, we had all of these, see, there's an example of that. They couldn't do it that one Friday. And look, can you all see where it says must like dogs? That's a, that's a detail about their party, right? So, um, so, so what we would do is we would, this line of, of, of hosts, right? We would, all oh, right, I think I have a picture of this down here. We, we would go down that line with a microphone and we would have each person pitch their party. But it was really important to show them and really force them to pitch their party in like literally five words. So it's like, 
your, your neighborhood, you know, your location, and something special about your party and when your party is going to be. And that's it. And we had to like kind of really set a rhythm because then we could run down a very long line of people and they would each do it really quickly. And then, um, and, and so then we would, once everybody's parties had been pitched, we would then tell everybody, okay, stand up and come on down and find the person, um, you know, uh, whose party you want to go to, who you live near and, you know, who you got a good vibe from, right? And, uh, and so, and then we had lots of different ways of making that matchmaking process work. Like in one version we, that we experimented with, in one version, we had people write down on sticky notes their name and contact information so that they wouldn't have to fill out the sign-up form. They would just stick it on the, um, on the sign-up form. And then the, the host could then take that information and write it down, process it. Um, that didn't work so well. So eventually we just went back to the other way, but here's, here's, let me wrap up now. There's so many little details like for, that I would love to talk to you about, for example, like the, um, how did we process all these sign up forms and get everybody's names into a database so that we could like send them emails to rem remind them when to go and get them in touch with each other and all that stuff. And so we created all these volunteer teams that would do that. And we created those teams in kind of a similar way to how, how I just described us forming these phone banking teams, except we used Zoom, you know, and we used, uh, um, and, you know, we used text and, and we used email to, to get those virtual teams together. But what it all came down to was this, was this is a picture of one of these circles where this host was surrounded by the people that had come to join her phone banking party. And um, so they had written their names down on her sign-up sheet and they were making plans for like the date they were going to go to her house. And they were just, and, and I overheard, there was one day when I overheard in this group, somebody said, well, um, I'm going to bring, because, you know, they, people still would start arranging, they would start, org instead of being like, well, who's going to lead us and whose house should we do this at, which the group is really incapable of doing because of just manners and, you know, we had to have a structure to settle those questions. But once that basic structure was settled, then people got, were able to get really creative, right? So then they started planning their party and what each, and, and talking about what each person could bring to the party. And there was this one uh, moment when I realized why this was working, because all our previous attempts had fallen apart because follow through didn't happen. People didn't, they just didn't show up to the thing they said they were going to show up to. And, um, and, you know, one thing I learned as an organizer long ago was that uh, a powerful force in organizing is a personal relationship. And so as, as an organizer that was like knocking on doors and doing one-on-ones with workers as a young organizer, I learned, I was trained that I needed to create this personal relationship with each worker I was organizing or each activist I was trying to mobilize and then use that personal relationship to like get them to follow through on the stuff that they said they were going to do. And so in this circle here, I heard somebody say, I'm going to bring this dip recipe that uh, you all are going to love. And so then somebody else said, great, I'm going to bring chips. They, these two people had made a commitment. <laughs> and it wasn't like an abstract commitment to save the world or get Bernie Sanders elected. They had already kind of done that by coming up, but now they had made a very specific commitment. They had taken on a role and they had committed to each other to play two parts in this chip and dip operation, right? <laughs> because if the dip person didn't come, then there were going to be chips with no dip. And if the chip person didn't come, there was even worse, even a more catastrophic situation. There was going to be dip, really good dip with no chips. So this might sound silly, but this kind of commitment that people were making to each other in these kinds of arrangements and uh, that they were making on their own is what got them to come. And we didn't need to organize that. We created the structure and then they made the commitments to each other. And so what that resulted in was this huge map. Sorry again for the blurry pictures, but um, copy of a copy of a copy. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, we had this, you know, soon this, our map on our website filled up with literally thousands of phone banking events. Every time we went to a city, and did a whole bunch of those or events uh, that I just described, which we called barnstorms. Um, they created, you know, hundreds of these phone banking events, 
And we just kept going around the country. You know, we just had a machine that that churned out those events. And um, oh, that's something else. <laughs> and so, so, um, so the so so that is uh, how we wound up making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of calls, contacting hundreds of thousands of voters, and really mobilizing people in a new way. And if Bernie had won the nomination, we were going to be able to, um, we were going to, you know, what we, the, we had dreams of taking this structure and spending a lot more time on training and um, giving people specific roles, creating like more layers of, we, this, this system that I just described, I didn't have, I don't have time to go into it, but we had lots of layers of, of like leadership and trainers and all kinds of different roles, but if we had had more time, I think we could have just done, you know, uh, something so much more powerful and deep. And so the great thing about, um, because in the end, this thing that I just, this machine I just tried to describe to you, it's not actually a very good machine for getting people to, you know, for, for mobilizing enough votes to win a national election. Um, but it was, but it was a really good system for mobilizing enough people to do something really big you know, uh, like call all those hundreds of thousands of people and create that momentum and create that movement and, and have these thousands of events. Um, and so you're actually in a way better position than uh, Bernie was in a president in his presidential campaign, because you don't, you know, as the, the science and the method of your of, of your movement um, goes, you know, that, that I've heard, been hearing a lot about lately is you just need to get a certain number of people to take a really important action. And so, um, so this kind of team building, working out these logistics around how to really get the most out of every day and every event, I think is really going to pay huge um, dividends for, for you all. But let me stop there. Um, I think I went a few minutes over, but I hope that we still have plenty of time. And I've, and depending on what topics we get into, I've got a few more slides to, to show. But let me stop the share now to make sure that everybody can see me. And... Uh, and then I can see you. And yeah, so can we stop? Do we still have a little bit of time for a Q&A? We do, yeah. Thank you so much for that comprehensive overview. So we have quite a few questions here and I'll just take a couple that um, are in the same genre. So one question was, what would you have done differently in the early stages of the Bernie campaign? Um, well, I wish we had, I'm trying, you know, it's easy to answer that question in hindsight, you know, for like, you yeah. know, knowing what I know now, what should we have done right away? Um, there were a lot of things that we, as we kind of explain in the book, there were a lot of things that just sort of the normal way of campaigning that the, that our campaign leaders were used to. I'm not criticizing them at all or blaming them. It's just that the normal way you campaign is not the way I just described, mobilizing people in those later 46 states on day one of the campaign. So it was very hard for us to get resources to mobilize those people, right? So I guess one, one way to apply this is, you know, we, we should have started with like a full 50 state campaign with, um, you know, the voter file for all 50 states with, you know, a, a decent number of staff people, organizers, you know, responsible for all 50 states for those later 46 states. And we, you know, and we should have had, um, it would have been great if we'd had this integrated plan that where the whole campaign was working together, you know, with that giant national mobilization in mind. So I guess one way to translate that or to generalize that for all movements is, you know, think ahead to the biggest, most incredible movement that you can imagine, right? And start, you know, and think about what resources will you need to handle uh, a movement on that scale. And it's not necessarily money or staff. It's like, you know, um, I don't know what it is for, for you all, but, but that's something to think about, right? Is start planning for something huge uh, right now. And, you know, and if you can simulate some, you know, fire drills somehow, you know, so that you can, uh, um, you know, some, somehow get that experience of what it would be like, you know, to, to be having stuff happening all over the place all at once, you know, maybe there's a way that you could, simulate that. We, we tried to find ways of doing that, but I really wish we had done way more. Um. Great, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So another semi-related question is, how do you go from a couple of people showing up to an event to a whole room full of people showing up to one? 
I can see how this method would work after you have a critical mass of attendees, but most of our events don't have this number of people. Well, in some ways, it's really great to not have that number of people because you can then handle it, right? And like one, another campaign I watched very closely was uh, I, I worked on the Obama campaign and I wrote about the Obama campaign in, in back in 2008, which was kind of a historic campaign that opened up a bunch of new ways of organizing and stuff. But there was this one part of the campaign that was probably the most important part, uh, and it was South Carolina and one of those first four states. And the, the, the team, I bet there's a few people that worked on that camp, on that South Carolina campaign on this call actually, but there was, there was a team on the ground in South Carolina. And just like the person who asked that question said, there was only like a few people showing up to events because everybody knew that this guy, Barack Obama had no chance of winning. And everybody knew that Hillary Clinton had it all locked up, this recurring theme in our politics, you know, <laughs> and uh, and um, and so so people didn't come. But then Obama won in Iowa, you know, like probably the second whitest state in America, you know, <laughs> and so and this and, and a big reason why, like, especially black voters in South Carolina were not interested in Barack Obama was because they're just like, he's not going to win. He can't win. Never going to happen. So when he won in Iowa, suddenly these meet these these events in all over South Carolina, where nobody was showing up, suddenly hundreds of people were showing up. And so, yes, related to my answer to the last question was the beautiful thing about that South Carolina campaign was they planned every single day. Everything they were doing was planning for that moment. And and so, you know, so even though they had only been running these meetings with just a few people showing up, they were running them. You know, and so they were so ready for that flood of volunteers to come out and you all are going to have that because when the media decides that you are the big next thing to talk about that you're the fight that they're going to sell tickets to, you know, when they make that decision. Uh, and you're all over the news constantly, then you're going to be ready, you know, for this flood of people coming out. Wow, that gives me a lot of motivation. Thank you. <laughs> um, so another pretty big question is uh, the mobilization effort we need to bring about change now is on a scale never seen before in history. With so much inertia, denial, comfort zones and dependency to break through in the Western world, how can we cut through all of this when both civil resistance results in personal discomfort and cutting down on fossil fuels also results in a drop in living standards. Well, I maybe I will screen share again here and because I had this other thing I wanted to talk about, but I but I think that 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 kind of answers that question. I really think that we hold ourselves back. Uh, and by we, I mean activists, progressives, people that want to see a better world, people that want to save the world. We hold ourselves back because it's it's almost too painful to hope that everything can change, right? But I'm a real history buff, and I really recommend that if you have not, if you don't read a ton of like world history from you know the past thousand years kind of thing, that you really should, because what you see in history is that there are these moments when everything changes, and sometimes that moment is like two weeks, and sometimes that moment is twenty years. But either way. Um, you know, 20 years is not that long. I know a lot of you young people on the call feel like 20 years is a long time, but a bunch of the rest of us on this call can tell you that 20 years is like nothing, you know? And so, um, so, you know, the, the, the world can completely change in a moment, but it's a really valid question because there to say that there are these huge movements that erupt and go nowhere right and like nothing happens and i i just want to let me share my screen again for a second if that's okay because i i i knew i probably didn't have time for this but this was like the first really big uh crazy protest i was ever involved in and it was way back in 1997 and it was the detroit free press which is the big newspaper in detroit strike they went on strike and it was a big battle between newspaper workers and the uh the big giant corporations that own all the newspapers. There's like two of them. And so they were trying to bust the union, but not just bust the union. They were trying to really destroy the local press so they could just make money with like one basic website that they copied all over the place. They saw that coming and that's what they were trying to do. And so I wish I could have found a picture of the 
like at, for, for, for literally two months, there were several thousand people surrounding the newspaper and not letting papers in or out. Right. They, they started trying to fly the Sunday edition out with helicopters. There were pitched battles. They, 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 people were almost killed. There were like hundreds of people fighting. There were like armed guards, you know, from the Pinkertons, like literally the Pinkertons. Um, and it was, it was this insane thing. Like this, it was, it was the biggest, like most violent and chaotic thing that I could have ever imagined. And they completely shut down this newspaper. And guess what? None of you have heard of it. Probably two of you have heard of it. And, and nobody in America heard about it in 1997. Nobody heard about it. Um, and why is that? It's because the, the labor movement was so um, used to nobody caring about them that they didn't even try to do, even though it was a newspaper worker strike, they didn't even try to like get press. They didn't even try to put on a show for the national uh, media, you know? But then, you know, there was like the Battle of Seattle, which some of you weren't even born then, but uh, it's crazy how, how time is flying. But this was a huge, you know, anti-globalization, you know, protest that really was made for the cameras. And the activist leaders that led this, and some of you are on this call, they, and, and your movement is a descendant of this movement, um, they, it's, you know, partly, uh, they knew how to like stage a show for the cameras. And so there was an amazing, everybody heard about it. It's all anybody talked about for like a year was this big anti-globalization movement. The problem was with the strike, with the, with, uh, the, with the big Detroit free press strike, there was a very clear demand, right? But nobody ever heard about this. The problem here with the anti-globalization movement was there was no demand. There was literally no demand, you know? And, um, you know, Occupy Wall Street was sort of a resurgence of this kind of movement. And they like explicitly didn't have a demand, you know? <laughs> and, but again, it was like a really amazing show for the cameras. And so don't, we, we cannot get, um, we cannot get disheartened by these massive movements that bring out tons and tons of people and don't really make a big concrete change because a lot of these movements, there wasn't really a leadership and there wasn't a demand, right? That, and so they weren't gonna stick it out for the demand. All these movements, like the Occupy Wall Street thing that took off all across the, the country, um, and the you know and the the like anti globalization movement, it didn't um, it they just petered out right. But you all have these very specific demands. Um, you your your movement has a, has very specific demands, country by country, right, and and as a and as a globe, and and so it's like you're not going to stop doing the civil disobedience. We're not going to stop doing the civil disobedience and really shaking the world at its foundation, at its fossil fuel foundation um, until the demands are met. And that's the perfect equation, right? And so if so, I believe that this movement is going to capture the world's attention and it's gonna be the only thing that the world is talking about for some period of time. And if you, and, and that, what that's gonna do is that's gonna bring millions of people to come sign up on your websites. And then you're going to email those people and you're going to bring them to trainings where you get where you find the people that want to do more and more serious civil disobedience and you're going to shake the foundations of this of this world economic system more and more strongly and that's because you're not going to give up until the demands are met and the minute they meet those demands you're going to increase your demands and keep going right and so the me so don't be cynical about public opinion and about the media the media will cover that story. If you give them that story, the media will cover it. There's no journalist, there's no TV producer that's like, I'm supporting fossil fuel interests because I'm a capitalist. I'm not going to cover this incredible story that's going to get us ratings. Those, like maybe Rupert Murdoch is like that, but nobody else is like that. And, and there's lots of producers that cover, you know, that, that are making decisions about what's going to go on their TV shows and go into their papers, right? They're going to respond to the movement that you build. And, um, you know, and so, and then don't be cynical about public opinion because like public opinion changes in a heartbeat. If, you were, if you're living in the United States or watching, you know, Donald Trump changed public opinion uh, on, for half the country on like five different things and just radically changed what the Republican party stands for just by showing leadership, right? The Black Lives Matter movement, at least in the United States, I believe it really changed um, public opinion on a, on a bunch of, uh, in a bunch of ways. And I think a lot of it snapped back because that movement did kind of peter out and there, there weren't 
very concrete uh, demands, not criticizing or anything, but it, you know, but but there was but there was a moment when public when opinion polling in the United States showed like this incredible shift in public opinion around race and racism because of that movement. So um, so I so I believe uh, so hopefully I've answered the question. I know I went on a little long, but. Um, but I think that's what's going to, I think that's what's in the future for this movement. And it's going to be really exciting. That's fantastic. And thanks again for, sh for sharing your screen. That's great. So um, another question from Hannah Weir is, how could these mobilization techniques be used for more digital or non-contact outreach, such, a, such as posters and physical resources that people see, but you aren't meeting them directly? And then she goes on to say, especially in areas without established local groups. Um, and sorry, can you repeat the first part of the question? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. How could these mobilization techniques be used for more digital or non-contact outreach? Uh, and then okay. her examples were something like posters or physical resources. Yeah, you know, it's funny, like uh, um, a lot of, I, I think that like something that people love to do is make beautiful posters and make beautiful signs, right? And to spread the word like that. And, you know, on the Bernie campaign, I actually had the privilege of like getting breakfast just about every week that I was in Vermont, which was for just a few months with Ben Cohen uh, of ice cream fame, you know, of Ben and Jerry's. And he was like obsessed with this idea that, uh, that we should just be asking everybody in our movement to be making um, like these big, beautiful signs out of LED string, you know, that would say Bernie, you know, and just stand on every overpass and hold up that sign. And, you know, these big, beautiful lighted signs at night, you know, and, um, and he said, we should just, you know, mobilize tons and tons of people to do that all across the country. And, um, and I said, Ben, we have to win votes. We have to get people to call voters in these first few states, you know, and uh, we just need to have everything just go into that, you know, and I really kind of regret that actually I, I wish that um, I wish that we had actually because, you know, in the end, in hindsight, you know, we just saw that like so many people were not willing to do the phone banking and and of course we did offer those people other stuff to do but but like the idea of just putting up signs and like, you know in political circles, that's like the research doesn't back up, you know, the idea of putting up a bunch of signs, you know, the social science research on how to win votes doesn't support, you know, a big, beautiful sign uh, strategy. But I think that would have been cool if we had actually done that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yes. So, oh, no, I think I actually have to jump. I'm sorry. I have to jump for another call for the same movement. Uh, so good. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, um, I'm sorry to be jumping off so abruptly, but I just realized what time it is and I don't want to be late for this other call. <laughs> that is great. It has been such a pleasure and thank you so, so much and have a okay. lovely rest of your weekend. Okay. And, and also if anybody um, wants to, if anybody has anything to follow up with, uh, you know, questions or anything, you can always email me at Zach Exley at Gmail. It's just my name at Gmail. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to hear what, what's going on in your local group and, um, you know, uh, help out in any way that might be possible or just brainstorm or whatever. So, yeah. Well, thanks That's so much. A very for kind offer. Yeah. Oh, thank you okay. so much as well. Okay. All right. Bye everybody. Take care. Bye. Um, wow, everyone. Uh, I, I know there were so many other questions that we had to get to. Um, but again, that was a very kind offer of Zach to offer his, his personal email. So if you do have a question that you'd like us to send along to him, maybe we can cobble together a, a big list of them and send them forward for you. And then we can email um, everyone who signed up for this call. That might be most efficient. Um, so do keep sending your questions to Ian. Um, so the next thing that we're going to switch into now is a civil resistance pitch from someone named Derek. And um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Derek to speak to how important it is that we not only mobilize and get the word out and organize in our communities, but, but do tangible action and the relevance of that today in terms of the climate crisis. So I'm going to turn it over to Derek. Hi, everyone. Um, that was a lot from Zach. That was really cool. I, uh, I actually 
told him before this call started that I listened to his book on audiobook while I was working in my garden just outside. Um, really cool stuff. Uh, so my name's Derek. I am a biologist and political organizer. There's my degree up there. And um, the reason I was listening to Zach's book is because I got into caring about our environment uh, first through, or acting on my care for our environment first through political means. And I've worked on four different political campaigns uh, for the Green Party in my country. I'm from Canada. And uh, a few of those have actually been successful, which is extremely, extremely rare. Um, I come from a place that is, I think, uniquely primed to, to deal with this stuff. And I think one of the things that's uh, causing that is that we are surrounded by some really, really beautiful, beautiful wilderness that that puts us in touch with nature a lot. And I think that's something that a lot of people in a lot of places are missing is, is understanding exactly what the world they live in looks like. Um, I'm assuming that all of you, if you're not at least passingly familiar with this movement are already involved with this movement. And I don't wanna bore you with a bunch of details that you've already heard. I was asked to give this civil resistance pitch um, from a talk that I give regularly. Uh, in about 10 minutes. So I'm going to try to abbreviate it as much as possible. And I've probably already spent too much time introducing myself here. But I think uh, to recenter ourselves, we can never forget just how dire the situation we are in is. Everybody knows that we're in a climate emergency. That's why we're all here. If you're not here, I don't know how you got here. Uh, for that reason, if you're not here for that reason. But when I say emergency, I don't mean like call the fire trucks. I mean, every single person in their own personal lives has to take to heart that this is something they have to personally deal with. And there's two real facts for this for me and two images uh, that I don't normally get to share at talks. So I'm going to take this opportunity to screen share with you the things that scare me by far the most. I've seen this little graph here. This is actually um, just a section of a Just Have a Think YouTube video. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this image a couple times, but this is what the world looks like at 1.5 degrees. And we're at 1.2 right now. It's uh, so this has changed from what we're what we're living in right now, but I'm just gonna play this over for the next hundred years, so you can have an idea of what it's gonna look like where you live. Because I want you to think about how possible it is to grow food in these regions based on these biomes. Everyone understands that this is an emergency to some degree or another, but I don't think that everybody understands that what we are actually heading for is where most of us are living, turning into a desert. If we go back just that far, 2070, basically nowhere on earth is gonna be able to grow food except for this little band here, up here, and up here. There's going to be a global famine this year from a lack of crops of about 5% of the world's calories just from the war in Ukraine and Russia, making those crops unavailable, 5%. What the climate is giving us is nowhere being able to grow food except for small portions of the earth. When civilizations run out of food, they collapse. And what collapse looks like isn't just slow migrations, 
peaceful readjustments. It is mass murder, mass rape, and mass conflict. It is billions of people dying. When we run out of food, we're fucked. That's it. There's nothing else that we can do. The only reason that I'm doing this, I'm not an environmentalist. I don't care about nature. I don't have a great love for animals or anything. I am a biologist, but that was for, I wanted to tackle human longevity issues. I don't have any great care for this. I am personally terrified of what's coming down the pipeline for us. And Zach spent a lot of time showing us what is possible with a small number of dedicated people. I want you to understand what is going to happen, not what's possible, what's definitely going to happen if we don't act. And understand that not acting is a far, far greater risk than going and gluing your hand to a road or chaining yourself to some infrastructure. Because if you don't act in these minorly transgressive ways, relative to what's happening, you're going to starve to death or you're going to be killed by somebody 10 to 30 years from now. The other thing that scares the shit out of me is this. This is from the most recent IPCC report. This, uh, I'm still sharing, right? Yeah, this one thing here, it's a nice little euphemism they've got for what we colloquially call, colloquially call tipping points, large scale singular events. Um, zoom out a bit so you can see, but this third line here, is it about two degrees? This is two degrees. This is 1.5. Wait, is that right? Yeah. Sorry, the lower one's two degrees here. And this is 1.5. When we hit two degrees, the chances of a single large irreversible vent skyrocketing the temperature by a degree or more, i.e. a tipping point that I'm sure you're all familiar with at this point, becomes a very high probability. And if we have a single one of those go off, we're gonna skyrocket right past another degree, every single one that goes up. And we're gonna go all the way up to what I just showed you in this last one. This is literally the end of the world. And there is no other, course of action that we've got that's going to work at this point. Everyone here, everyone here has filled out countless petitions. You have emailed or phone called all of your elected representatives. You've gone on these climate marches. And we know that none of this has worked at the scale that's necessary. We've gotten paper straws at this point. We've got plastic bag bands. None of this works and you know it. Any excuse that you have to say, I don't want to deal with this, I don't want to go out and sacrifice my ability to go fly somewhere. I don't want to possibly jeopardize my career. Nothing else is going to work. If you don't take those sacrifices or put yourself in those risky positions, you're not going to be able to have a future. That's it. Any argument about, I'm not going to have a future if I go and get a criminal record, which you're not guaranteed to get a criminal record from doing this stuff. Any argument about that, is bullshit and you know it because if you have a criminal record in a world that's falling apart it's still better that you fought to do something for this than nothing at all because not having a criminal record in a world that's falling apart means you failed not having chained yourself to something not having glued yourself to something not having stood up and said that this is the only way that we're going to make this change is a failure personally on your behalf. I don't know what my time's at here, but I don't want to turn this all into a lecture of you're terrible people if you don't do this because you're not terrible people. You're the only people that actually care about this enough to show up. You are the best people in the world, really, is what I'm saying. And I'm presenting you with this opportunity. I'm sure you've heard some of these points before, but I want everyone to remember that we are it. It's literally the people who are here listening to this. We are it. We are the future. We are the hope. Zach's spent 45 minutes, to me, reiterating a single point, is that 
all of this stuff starts at a very small percentage of people, a very, very small number of folks. You've all heard the Freedom Riders story. Um, I'm not going to go through that whole thing, but you know that it started with 14 people. And every single thing, every major win that happened in the civil rights movement happened after those 14 people went and got on that bus, drove down to, to Alabama, were barricaded inside, had their bus set on fire, had to escape through concussions and beatings, barely made it, sent to jail, and were determined to get back on the bus. I've been arrested three times now for this. My first time was uh, a bit adjacent. It was out at Ferry Creek. I was the first person to hike in through the bush uh, after a police blockade was set up out at Ferry Creek to get arrested. And it was at a camp where this is hours out in the bush um, for anyone not familiar with what Ferry Creek was. It's the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. It was to stop old growth logging here on the island that I live on. And there was like 200 people at that camp the last time I went there. The cops showed up and threatened to arrest everybody who didn't leave basically immediately. And when I got there, there was seven people, seven. I was one of seven people. And I almost cried because I was like, is this all we have to solve this? This is the, the nobody, everyone's just going to tuck their tail between their legs and run. Like, does nobody understand that this is our literal futures we're dealing with here? And I said, well, fuck it. And I put my arm in the ground and the cops showed up and they, you know, had to jackhammer me and several other people out of contraptions we were in. And it took them a while. But you know what changed, though? The next day more people showed up. In fact, it was my partner who showed up the next day because she was worried what had happened to me because there's no reception out there. So she hiked in too. And that day, <laughs> there was two people who sat down to get arrested. It was her and her friend. That was it. I think that was the lowest point of that entire movement. But what happened after that was people started coming in in droves. The next day, it was 10, 15, 20. And we built infrastructure and we had people chained into things that took forever to get them out of. We had people hidden up in tree sets and we bought time and we hit that tipping point. And I ended up working on some stuff, uh, being able to keep track of how many people were getting arrested. And the biggest week of arrest that we had was over a hundred people. We had a day where 70 people got arrested for that movement. Over 1,500 people have been arrested out at the Ferry Creek blockade. And that started with seven people. It takes courage. It takes understanding that no one is out there coming to save us. I grew up with this myth where I believed that there was a group of smart people who spent their entire days sitting in rooms, solving the world's problems. I was told they were scientists. And I thought, great, <laughs> someone's looking out for us. You know, I was under the impression that politicians had to listen to reality. and had to listen to what they had to say. And after I came to understand what the climate crisis was about, I realized very quickly that no one is actually listening to them. The people that are listening to them are us. So if you want to save the world, your own world, but the world of your family and your friends and everyone you hold dear, you have no choice. This is it. We know that traditional methods we don't work. And we know that we have to be in the public eye. One thing I didn't mention about Ferry Creek is that while it was the largest act of civil disobedience in the history of Canada, the only thing it succeeded in doing was pushing public perception a little bit and getting a small, small chunk of land temporarily protected by the government. And that's because if you ask almost anybody in Canada 
they'll have no idea what the fuck Fairy Creek is. If you ask most of the people on this island, on Vancouver Island, they'll have no idea what Fairy Creek is because it didn't affect them and they could just ignore it. That's the reason that having marches and little banner drops and things on the side of the road don't work is because the people who support it, they'll honk their horn. They'll say, hey, great. Somebody cares about this. Everybody else, not my problem. They got shit to do. They'll move past it, which is why we block off critical infrastructure, which is why we cause problems in society, which is why we create disorder, because we are holding the world hostage because our futures are being held hostage right now. I choose my future over the world. So I've got one question, and this is our ask. Uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms after this, and we're going to discuss everything we've heard. And I'm sorry for the much less light tone that I've taken than everybody else so far, but I'm sick of being kind about this. <laughs> you know, I wanted to have kids, and I don't get to have kids unless we get this right. So the one ask is, what are you willing to do to step up into civil resistance in your community, in your campaign, in your country? There's, I don't know how many countries represented here, but I know there's at least 10 in the A22 network. And all of them have very, very simple demands, very straightforward. I'm with Save Old Growth. Obviously, Save Old Growth is the demand. There's Just Stop Oil, it's to Just Stop Oil. You know, there's Fireproof Australia and all sorts of other ones. Very simple demands. And we are causing problems for the government until they are forced to meet our simple demand. And by doing that, we will prove, we will prove in a larger sense that this is what it takes and it can be done, that we can win. Because everyone's disillusioned at this point. Everyone is so sick of hearing like, oh, the climate, everyone's at the point where it's like, well, we're fucked. And that's as far as it's gone. And that's what the oil industry wants, you know? We're going to prove what it takes to win and that if we do step up and be courageous and understand that we are holding our futures and the entire world's futures in our, law, in our hands, that we can make this happen. So there are three options for stepping up into civil resistance to help. Option one, sign up for civil resistance and attend a nonviolent training as soon as possible. We're hosting these trainings in all of our respective movements in our countries every single week. Two, and or... You can do this as well. Um, and none of these are mutually exclusive. So do all three. Donate money. Um, this was written, uh, this, this figure from the UK. So <laughs> forgive, uh, apologies for anybody who's not there. If you're able to, a thousand pound donation can keep a block team running uh, in action for a week. And we need a lot of block teams. Block teams being the, the people that are blocking the infrastructure, the small teams that we've got organized. I'm sure everybody already knows that. And the third ask is to, Help with mobilization by setting up talks in your area and doing flyering. We need as many people giving out as many flyers as possible, and we do need help organizing talks in all of our countries because the more talks we have, the more people we're going to reach, right? So thanks for listening, everybody. We can do this, but we have to do this. Wow, thank you, Derek. And uh, for those of you who maybe have not seen, um, those asks that Derek just shared with us are actually in the chat. And I'm hoping that one of our hopes for tech support can, um, can add the A22 networks and websites. And it looks like that will be added to the chat. So hold on for that. Um, before we go into breakout rooms, we're actually gonna be hearing from two people um, who have uh, been involved with two civil resistance campaign. The first of whom is Julia who is actually in action with um, Save Old Growth. So we're gonna hear a testimonial of what an action looks like for Julia and we'll hand it over to her right now. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I'm really bad at, at preparing for things like this and I was anticipating a call with 20 or 30 people. Um, so forgive me if I fumble a little bit. Um, but yeah, uh, my name is Julia. A lot of people within the Sable Growth community know me as Bug. Um, I'm 24 years old and I often say that I came out of the womb with an immense uh, amount of climate anxiety. 
um, I've always felt like it, it's it been so evident and so all encompassing and consuming and just kind of suffocating. Um, since I was a kid, um, I grew up in a couple different uh, third world countries. I had, I had uh, missionary expat parents. Um, so I saw the impacts of the climate crisis uh, on third world countries from, from uh, first world countries. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time um, engaging on the back end of things, you know, um, calling my MLAs, signing petitions, um, uh, attending non-disruptive protests, um, you know, like advocating on social media. And then last summer hit, um, I, I reside in, in so-called Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, and last summer we were hit with uh, some really devastating climate catastrophes. Um, we experienced a heat dome that claimed the lives of 600 people, um, fires that burned down entire towns, um, followed by flooding that claimed the lives of over 140,000 farm animals and displaced and killed countless wildlife that we don't even have numbers on. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say that it, it took that long and it took that to be the tipping point where I personally said enough is enough, like none of this is working. I need to engage in something so much bigger than myself. Um, so last September, I, I went to Ferry Creek and I was um, arrested for uh, violating an injunction there. Um, and for me, I know it's different for a lot of people, but for me, arrest was something that I didn't ever put any consideration into, um, which I don't necessarily recommend, but it just kind of felt like it, it was a no brainer. Like it was just something that, that was effective and it needed to be done. And just knowing that, um, that our government stands to make a lot of money from uh, the logging of old growth and the reason that these things are ongoing, even though Canada has uh, actively like acknowledged the climate emergency, the reason that they are not taking these steps towards change is because they stand to make a lot of money from them. So the reason it's so important to engage in nonviolent civil resistance and to go out onto highways or, or block um, logging roads and get arrested is because it costs them so much money, you know? So, if they stand to make a lot of money, we need to cost them more money than they stand to make. So arrest was something that just made, made sense for me personally to do. Um, so I came back from Ferry Creek after my first arrest and I joined the Save Old Growth campaign um, during its first iteration in January. And within the span of two weeks, I was arrested four more times uh, for gluing myself to the highway, uh, blocking morning rush hour traffic and just engaging in nonviolent civil resistance. Um, and it seems crazy. Um, and again, I didn't put a ton of thought into it when I did it, but I, I have no regrets over my actions. Um, in two and a half weeks, I'm going to be going to prison. I'll be going to the Alouette Women's Correctional uh, Center in so-called Maple Ridge. Um, I'm being sentenced to two weeks uh, incarceration and probably 18 months probation, the terms of which I'm not yet aware of. Um, so it's been a crazy journey. Um, and I don't consider myself to be an activist. I am just a normal person that feels so suffocated um, that if, if I don't do something, it's just going to consume me. And what quality of life will I have then, you know? Um, like, like Axe, um, Derek, sorry. Um, I, you know, I want to have kids, you know, I want to have a future. I, I went to university and I studied music production and music business. You know, I wanted to be a tour manager. Um, and now I have a criminal record and I can't go to the States. Um, and that's okay. Um, because I wouldn't be able to do those things on a dead planet anyway. And like a lot of my a lot of my peers say, and something that always sticks with me, and I always reiterate to myself when I think about uh, my future prospects and going to prison, like imprisonment is not the end of the world. 
engaging in civil resistance is not the end of the world. Making these sacrifices is not the end of the world. The end of the world is literally the end of the world. Um, and I use that to center myself when I think about what the future holds and it allows me to keep my head down and focus on, on um, what we're really working towards. Um, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that incredible statement. Uh, we'll, we'll switch over to David who actually just spent the last week in prison due to his actions with Just Stop Oil in the UK. So we'll pop over to David now. Thank you, Tidal. Um, yeah, I'm David, I'm 35, and yeah, I'm part of the Just Stop Oil Co Coalition in the UK. So as Tidal said, I've recently been on remand for my involvement in this group. Um, it was breaking a civil injunction uh, aimed at preventing our protests um, outside this fossil fuel um, distribution centre. Um, I spent six nights in prison uh, and it gave quite a good insight into that world. Um, I've only, I was only out on Thursday, so I've, I've not really had time to process because it's been quite busy um, since then. Um, but my main thought is that it was bonkers. So many men were kept in one space. There was 900 blokes like in one space, which is crazy. Um, the other headline is that it was fine. Like I was initially in a cell with another Just Stop Oil member um, and that it was quite pleasant. <laughs> Then I changed prisons and then I was in a cell with um, someone different, um, like a member of the public, well, a prisoner. Um, and it was a different experience with regards to, yeah, a bit mentally taxing, but it felt like you could get into the rhythms and the routine of the prison and stay for longer. Um, six nights is quite a small sacrifice. I, yeah, it's just a dip of the toe. Um, and I recognize that I'm in a very privileged position. Um, I was aware when I went to break the injunction and not go to court that that was going to be the likely outcome. Um, and I kind of chose that path. Um, and I went in with this strong sense of purpose, um, knowing the consequences. Um, yeah, so my resolve was strong and it what I always chose, uh, whereas there's people in prison that I just thrown in there, like, um, and they don't have that choice. So I was very privileged to have that choice, um, although it was scary still. Um, and the support from the community when we were in there, like the emails to get in the UK, we have emails sent in, um, that was amazing. So the support from the community was such a boost. Um, when I got out, I under my phone and I had quite a few messages, one of which was from an old friend who, um, who hadn't spoken in a while and our profile isn't as such that they, they knew that I was in prison as yet so I was mentioning it in as I typed out my reply and I was thinking a lot has changed within five months um I've given up my job I'm now working full-time for Just Up Oil um I've been through court cases for my involvement with Insulate Britain and I've got more coming up for Just Stop Oil I've been to on remand um it's quite hard well to keep on top of but I wouldn't want to be doing anything else um this is the most important thing i feel like i could be doing with my life um and it's in my personality like to downplay my involvement and what i've been doing um so in some of the supportive messages that i was getting whilst in prison they were saying that i shouldn't be downplaying what i'm doing uh but for me i mentioned it earlier six nights didn't feel much of a sacrifice it's a dip of the toe um so i will downplay it but there's lots of inspirational people around me in the community doing incredible things like while I was in prison there was a message that got sent in about the ladies also on remand there was eight ladies at the same time did the same action also got on remand and in the message it explained that they were continuing their disobedience in prison which blew my mind like so it puts my sacrifice into perspective because they're they're incredible and they're doing incredible things and it just solidifies my knowledge that I'm in the right place and I'm doing the right thing, surrounded by the, all these incredible people. Um, so I'll finish on where I was before getting involved. Um, I was a care worker working with vulnerable young people, um, and I miss that massively. Like I miss the work massively, um, and I still identify as a care worker. And I see what I'm doing as an act of care, not just for the not just for the young people in my company anymore, but for everyone and every living thing in the world. 
and on the planet. Um, and that's the framing that I take into actions that I do. Like it's the framing that I take into the courtroom and say to the judges, it's either an act of care or inaction is neglect. Um, it gives me my resolve when sitting in my cells, like what I'm doing is an act of care. Um, when the governments aren't keeping us safe, it's time for people to try and step in and keep as many people as safe as possible. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll pass back to you, Tidal. Thank you so much, David and, and Julia as well. Um, hearing from you too has been really incredible. And thank you both for your sacrifice. <laughs>